Today we're going to investigate the propagation of mutual intensity. So in the previous lecture, we came up with a model for quasi-monochromatic light. This was light such that the field at a point P as a function of time could be separated out into an envelope A of P and T and a center frequency variation e to the minus i 2 pi nu zero t where the monochromatic nature of this implies that a of p and t plus some time delay tau is essentially the same as a of p and t um, and this would be for all tau values of interest, essentially for any time delay that could arise in a particular optical system. And we also defined mutual intensity as J of P1 and P2 which is the time average of A at P1 and T times the conjugate of the amplitude A, P2, and T. And this quantifies the spatial coherence of a source. So during the first part of the course, we looked at monochromatic fields. And in that case, we said that the field had the form of a scalar phasor as a function of space, g of x, y, and z, times e to the minus i 2 pi nu zero t, where nu zero is the frequency of the field. For quasi monochromatic fields, we're going to modify this to write g of x, y, z, and time t e to the minus i 2 pi nu zero t. Now the phasor of the field as a function of position is also a slowly varying function of time. And this is precisely our envelope A of P and T that we have up here. So this will allow us to use uh, much of the notation we developed in talking about things like diffraction and uh, imaging lenses and things of that nature. By just extending our phasor field, scalar field, g of x, y, z, to now be one in which that phasor is a slowly varying function of time. Now, when we say slowly varying, that's slowly varying relative to the center frequency, nu zero. Now, since nu zero is on the order of 10 to the 14th or 15th hertz, uh, this phasor could be varying at 100 megahertz, for example, and that would be very slowly varying in that context. Now, we'll also focus on, if we look at an, you know, an optical system with x and y coordinates and then the z coordinate corresponding to the optical axis, it was useful to focus in on different planes. z is equal to a constant. So we'll use that same notation. Here, we'll write, for example, g1 of x and y and time is this phasor field g of x and y at z is equal to z1, a particular plane here, and varying with time. 
And then in that plane, all right, so, so say some particular value of z is equal to z1, we can then talk about the mutual intensity in that plane. And we would write then, say, j1 for the mutual intensity in the plane z is equal to z1. And within that plane, we would uh, denote points by their x and y coordinates. So this could be j1 of x1 and y1 and x2 and y2. And that would be, by our definition, g1 of x1, y1, and time times g1 conjugate of x2, y2, and time. We'll take the time average of that. So that would characterize the spatial coherence properties in a given plane in our optical system. And then the idea of the propagation of mutual intensity is to figure out how this mutual intensity function changes as we propagate along the optical axis. For monochromatic light, we have been writing the output field in the plane z is equal to z2 as g2 of x and y is equal to the two-dimensional integral over an input plane, uh, z is equal to z1, of an impulse response, h of x and y, psi and eta, times the input field, g1 of psi and eta, d psi d eta. Now for the quasi monochromatic case, we'll simply allow these fields to vary slowly in time. G2 of x, y, and time will be equal to the integral of the impulse response, h of x and y, and psi and eta. That doesn't depend on time, but the input field will. G1 of psi and eta and time, and then we integrate over the entire input plane. Now, when we want to look at the mutual intensity in the output plane, so that will be J2, and the two points will be X1 and Y1, and X2 and Y2, and that by definition is the time average of G2, of x1 and y1 and time and g2 conjugate at the other point x2 y2 and time so that's the definition of the mutual intensity and now we're going to plug in what g2 of x y and time is in terms of this integral so that will be equal to the time average two-dimensional integral, so we do this term here first, that will be h of x1, y1, h of x1, y1, and psi1, eta1, times the input field g1, that psi1 and eta1 and time, d psi 1, d eta 1, and then times the conjugate of the field uh, to x2, y2. So that'll be the integral of the conjugate of h at x2, y2, psi 2, eta 2, and then we got the input field conjugated at psi 2, eta 2, and time, d psi 2, d eta 2. And then we close our brackets for the time average. Now, the impulse responses uh, do not depend on time, and therefore this time average is only going to operate on the, the g1 product there. 
And what is that product though? That's just the time average of G1 at a point, Xi1 eta1, times G1 conjugate at Xi2 eta2. And that's just the mutual intensity at the input. And so what we end up with is that this is equal to the integral of H of X1, Y1, and Xi1, eta1, times H conjugate at X2, Y2, and Xi2, eta2, times the time average of this product, which is just our J1, at Xi1, eta1, Xi2, eta2. And um, actually, then we have another double integral over the second set of coordinates. So then this now is an integral over d psi 1, d eta 1, and d psi 2, d eta 2. Yeah, that's a pretty messy expression. It's a quadruple integral. Uh, if you want, you could take this product here and think of that then as an impulse response for the mutual intensity. Now that's a function of eight variables, x1, y1, x2, y2 in the output plane, and psi1, eta1, psi2, eta2, in the input plane. So this is a four-dimensional linear system. So that's pretty, pretty uh, daunting amount of calculation involved there. But at least theoretically, that's what the result would be. Now, a case in which that uh, quadruple integral reduces to a double integral would be the very important practical case of spatially incoherent light. And recall the complex degree of coherence definition, mu of P1, P2, which is just a normalized version of the mutual intensity, J of P1, P2. We just divide by the square root of the intensity at P1 times the intensity at P2. Because then, uh, mu at P1, P1, the coherence uh, of a point with itself, would just be equal to, well, see, remember the mutual intensity when the two points are the same is just the common intensity. So this would just be I at P1. And then uh, P, P2 is equal to P1, so I of P2 is equal to I of P1, so you got I of P1 squared square root, that's just dividing by I of P1, and of course that's equal to 1. So a point is always 100% coherent with itself, the field at a particular point. Spatially incoherent light should conceptually have mu of P1 P2, where those are not the same point, well, that should be zero. Two points with different x and y coordinates should not be coherent. So let's say this was x1 and y1, so that's the point P1, It'll be right here. Any other point in the plane should be incoherent with the field at that point. But that's not actually physically possible. If two points are separated by something less than or about equal to a wavelength, say lambda zero, then they cannot be completely incoherent. In other words, an electromagnetic field, the oscillations of it can't be completely independent for two points that are closer together than a wavelength because it's just the way the electromagnetic fields work. They can't change significantly over a distance 
of a fraction of a wavelength. And so you need to have some coherence over a distance less than or about equal to a wavelength. So we might, for example, model this by having in a single plane a mu, say, of x1, y1, and x2, y2, the coherence between two points in the plane, might look something like e to the minus pi, um, x2 minus x1 squared, plus y2 minus y1 squared, over some constant a squared, where a might be on the order of the wavelength. And this, of course, would give you mu of x, y, and x, y. So the degree of coherence of a point with itself then would just be equal to, to 1. And so we could use that as the complex uh, coherence factor for, for spatially incoherent light. But that gets a little messy because then in those, uh, that quadruple integral, we have to integrate over this, this Gaussian. And so we're going to use something that's not quite physical, but simple. We're going to assume that the mutual intensity for incoherent light has the form J of x1 y1 and x2 y2 is equal to some constant k times the intensity at the point x1 y1 times a delta function of the difference of coordinates x2 minus x1 and y2 minus y1. All right, so that's going to simplify things because when we put that into our quadruple integral, these two delta functions will trivially get rid of two of the integrations and just replace x2 by x1 and y2 by y1. Now, the problem with that, right, that clearly uh, violates this, this idea, which should be physically required. And we can see the problem with that is when we do allow x1, y1, and x2, y2 to be the same. So we take j of x and y and x and y. What do we get? We get k times i of x and y. But what are the delta functions when the two arguments are zero? Well, they're infinite. So we get an infinite mutual intensity, which should be just the intensity at the field in question. But we get a constant times intensity times infinity. So it doesn't work out. So we'll have to live with that. We'll see what the problems that introduces, but we can still get a lot of useful results even using this overly simplified model of the coherence properties of spatially incoherent light. Uh, and later we'll look at uh, this more realistic type of model. So now let's look at the mutual intensity that we obtain if we put a spatially incoherent field as our input. So in the output plane, z is equal to z2, we'll have j2 of x1, y1, x2, y2 will be equal to at that factor k that goes along with our delta functions, we have a quadruple integral h of x1, y1, psi1, eta1, h conjugate of x2, y2, psi2, eta2. And then the mutual intensity at the input right, is the constant k times i1, x i1, eta1, 
delta of psi 2 minus psi 1, delta of eta 2 minus eta 1, and then d psi 1, d eta 1, d psi 2, d eta 2. So integrating over these delta functions is just going to cause psi 1 to become equal to psi 2, and let's just call that psi, and eta 1 to be equal to eta 2, and we'll call that eta. And so the result is j2 of x1, y1, x2, y2, will be equal to constant k. Two of these integrations just pull out from the delta functions, this condition. And so we'll, we'll be left with the integral of h of x1, y1, and psi and eta, times h conjugate of x2, y2, and psi and eta, times i1, of psi and eta, d psi, d eta. So there is an expression for the mutual intensity at the output plane when we have incoherent light as our input. Okay, so this is incoherent. But notice that in general, this output is not going to be incoherent. It's not going to consist of two delta functions, delta of x2 minus x1 times delta y2 minus y1 times other factors. So we find this important result that if we put spatially incoherent light at the input of an optical system, in general, we will get partially coherent light, spatially coherent light, at the output. Now, an important special case of this, right? Remember that if you take, uh, you have a mutual intensity function and you set the two points to be the same, you just get the intensity. So the intensity at the output, I2 at, we'll just call this X and Y, we'll just let X1, Y1 be equal to X2, Y2. But what is that? Well, we do the same thing over here. Let x1 equal x2 is equal to x, y1 is equal to y2 is equal to y, and then this just becomes constant k times the integral of, well then these two um, impulse responses have the same arguments, and so it's just that impulse response times its conjugate is just the magnitude squared of the impulse response h of x and y, psi and eta, magnitude squared, times the intensity at the input, x1, x psi and eta, d psi, d eta. And this gives us the impulse response for the intensity distribution when we have spatially incoherent light at the input. The output is not generally incoherent, uh, but we still have this relationship between the input and output intensities. And we could take this as defining the incoherent impulse response. H i of x and y, psi and eta, is just some constant k times the magnitude of h of x and y and psi and eta squared. Well, that is the incoherent impulse response of an optical system. And we'll look at this later in a future a lecture. But um, this tells us that if important parts of the impulse response are in the phase, then that's, that's for a coherent system. Then for the incoherent system, we'll lose that phase information and the system will not work at all as it does for a coherent system.
So we'll see, for example, the Fourier transforming lens is completely useless with incoherent light. It completely depends on the spatial coherence of the input. On the other hand, for a system in which uh, the important properties of the, of the impulse response are its uh, amplitude or its magnitude, well, then we'll still have those same properties, just squared, for the incoherent system. So for example, an imaging lens, the most important properties are the magnitude of the impulse response, which gives us this little uh, kind of point blurring function, little uh, resolution spot. And in the coherent, uh, incoherent system, we'll still have that because we'll just take the magnitude squared of this. So an imaging lens will work just as well for incoherent light as it does for coherent light. So this will be, we'll look at this in, in terms of the general ideas about the effect of spatial coherence, partial spatial coherence on an optical system. So we'll come back to that in a future lecture. Let's apply these ideas to free space propagation. Okay, so the simplest optical system. We know that the impulse response for free space propagation is just the paraxial approximation to a spherical wave, e to the i, 2 pi over lambda 0 d over i lambda 0 d, e to the i pi over lambda 0 d x minus psi squared plus y minus eta squared. So what would be the incoherent impulse response for free space propagation? h sub i of x and y and psi and eta. Well, we said it would be a constant k times the magnitude squared of this, of the coherent impulse response. Well, the complex exponentials, their magnitude squared is just equal to 1. So that just leaves the constant k over lambda 0 d quantity squared, which is a constant. That means that the output intensity in the plane z is equal to z2, i sub 2 of x and y, will be equal to k over lambda 0 d quantity squared times the integral over the input plane of the intensity, i1 psi eta d psi d eta, because the, the impulse response, the incoherent impulse response, is just a constant that can be factored out. So this whole uh, right side there is just equal to a constant. That says that the intensity, regardless of the variations of the intensity at the input plane, will just be constant. So we'll look something like this. So you have any arbitrary um, input here, I1 at x and y in the plane z is equal to z1, and then in the output plane z is equal to z2, the intensity will be uniform. And you can kind of uh, verify this for yourself. If you take a, a piece of white paper and you go into any room that's illuminated and you hold the white paper up, it looks white even though when you look around the room, of course, you see variations in intensity. So you're observing an environment with uh, incoherent light, and the result of all of those different objects in the room uh, with incoherent light is that they each produce just a uniform intensity on that piece of white paper, and so the, the paper just looks uniform. Okay, so that's actually kind of a good thing. Now, there's a little bit of a uh, tricky business here, and this comes about because of our uh, 
overly simplified model for incoherent light. If we look at the output power, I, uh, intensity rather, I sub 2 of x and y, what is this? Well, this is just k over lambda 0 d quantity squared. And this integral of the intensity over the entire input plane, well, that's just the total power in the input. Well, so let's now calculate the output power, P2. That'll be the integral over the output plane, I2 of x and y, dx dy. And what will that be? Well, that will be k over lambda 0 d quantity squared P1, which is the intensity at the output plane, and then integrated over the entire plane. Well, that is an infinite amount of area. So the output power would be infinite in this case. Obviously, if you have a uniform intensity over an infinite area, that's an infinite amount of power. That is due to the delta functions in our overly simplified model. We'll see the resolution of this later on. So that is not a rigorous model. Uh, we'll see how that, that is modified when we use a more realistic model for, the, uh, for incoherent light. What we'll see is that basically this intensity drops off uh, with x and y. So we've looked at the relationship between input intensity and output intensity when the input is spatially incoherent. Now let's look at the relationship between input intensity and output mutual intensity for free space propagation. So we need to calculate h of x1, y1, psi, and eta times h conjugate of x2, y2, and psi and eta. So we've got factors e to the i 2 pi over lambda 0 d over i lambda 0 d from the first term, and then the conjugate from the second term, e to the minus i 2 pi over lambda 0 d over minus i lambda 0 d. And then we've got the quadratic phase terms. For the first one, e to the i pi over lambda 0 d x1 minus psi squared plus y1 minus eta squared. That's from the first factor. And then e to the minus i pi over lambda 0 d x2 minus psi squared plus y2 minus eta squared. OK. And so we can uh, work out these quadratic terms uh, and write x1 minus psi squared from here, and then minus x2 minus psi squared from there. And then we've got the y and eta terms plus y1 minus eta squared minus y2 minus eta squared. And expanding those out, let's see. In the first case, we'll get x1 squared minus 2 psi x1 plus psi squared. And then from this, minus x2 squared minus 2 psi x2 plus psi squared. And then for the y terms, we'll have y1 squared minus 2 eta y1 plus eta squared minus y2 squared minus 2 eta y2 plus eta squared. And that here was it. 
psi squared inside the parentheses. All right, what's going to happen here? Well, here we're going to have a psi squared is going to cancel that. And here an eta squared is going to cancel there. And so this is going to end up being, well, we'll write it this way, minus, here we're going to have an x2 squared and an x1 squared. So the minus sign out front, that'll be minus x2 squared. And down here we'll have a minus y2 squared. And then here we've got an x1 squared with a minus sign out in front. We've got to put another minus sign inside. So that'll be minus x1 squared. And then here a y1 squared will become minus minus y1 squared. So those are the quadratic terms in x and y. And then we're going to have a whole bunch of terms with factors of 2. Uh, so we'll put plus 2 psi. Uh, let's see, here's minus minus 2 psi x2, so that's plus 2 psi x2, and then here, minus 2 psi x1, so minus x1. And then likewise for y, we have plus 2 eta y2 minus y1. So let's define this quadratic term here to be psi that difference to be delta x, and this difference to be delta y. In that case, what do we end up with? Our h of x1, y1, psi and eta, times the conjugate of h of x2, y2, and psi eta, will be equal to, uh, so this will give you e to the minus i psi, and up here, this product will be one, i times minus i is one, we got lambda zero d quantity squared, and then from these terms, all right, so you're gonna get uh, e to the i pi over lambda zero d times two, so that'll be e to the i 2 pi or lambda 0 d. And then we'll have, uh, well, here we'll have psi delta x. And here we'll have eta delta y. So we're going to take that expression, multiply it by the input intensity, and integrate over psi and eta, and that's going to tell us what the output mutual intensity will be. With that previous result, we now have the Van Sittert Zernike theorem. The output mutual intensity. Right, that characterizes uh, both the regular intensity and the spatial coherence properties, J2 of x1, y1, x2, y2, is equal to e to the minus i, that psi, which depends on the x1, y1, x2, y2 values, uh, over lambda 0 d quantity squared, times the constant k times the integral over the input intensity i1 psi and eta times e to the i 2 pi over lambda 0 d psi delta x plus eta delta y d psi d eta. So essentially it looks like an inverse Fourier transform of the intensity. That is what gives you the output mutual intensity. And if we look at the complex coherence factor, mu2 of x1, y1, x2, 
y2, which is just a normalized version of j2, well, that'll have the form e to the minus i psi, the integral i1 psi and eta, e to the i 2 pi or lambda 0 d, psi delta x plus eta delta y d psi d eta divided by the integral of the intensity at the input. All right, this will this will cause when uh, x1 is equal to x2, y1 is equal to y2, so the delta x and delta y are zero, then the numerator and denominator are the same because the in that case the psi term goes to zero. So this, other than this phase term here, as far as its magnitude, it's only a function of delta x and delta y. And so we'll use the notation, the magnitude of mu2 of delta x and delta y will be, well, we'll take the magnitude of a complex exponential, it's equal to 1. So we'll have the magnitude of the numerator, the magnitude of this inverse Fourier transform, i1 of psi and eta, e to the i, 2 pi over lambda 0 d psi delta x plus eta delta y integrated over the entire input plane, the magnitude of that over the total power in the input plane, integral i1 psi eta d psi d eta. So this gives us a formula for the magnitude of the complex coherence factor that describes the output coherence properties. And it depends on Fourier transform, or inverse Fourier transform, of the input intensity. And in this form, we're guaranteed that the magnitude of mu2 is 0, 0. So the coherence for two points that are not separated, so two points that are at the same point, is indeed equal to 1, 100%. It was very convenient to define a coherence length for a temporally uh, partially coherent source. And for partially spatially coherent fields, it's convenient to define a coherence area. So we'll define A sub C similar to what we did for a coherence time and coherence length. We'll take the magnitude of mu squared as a function of delta x and delta y, integrate over delta x and delta y. So keep in mind, this magnitude of mu squared in the output plane for any two points only depends on their separation delta x and delta y. So if we take any other two points that have that same separation, we'll have the same coherence properties in the output plane. So let's calculate this for the case of an input field which is spatially incoherent and has an intensity that is constant with the value i1 over a rectangular area, rect of x over w, rect of y over w. So this is going to look something like this. We've got a little incoherent right square here. And we want to go out. So this is in the plane z1. And we go out to a plane z2. And we want to calculate out here magnitude of mu2 of delta x delta y. Well, that's going to be right, this inverse Fourier transform, x1 of psi and eta, e to the i, 2 pi over lambda 0 d, psi delta x plus eta delta y, 
peak psi t eta. And that's going to break up into two one-dimensional integrals. One will involve rect psi over w times e to the i uh, 2 pi delta x over lambda 0 d, we just rearrange these factors here, times psi, and then d psi. And what is that? Um, so that's inverse Fourier transform of a rect, which is the same as the Fourier transform of the rect because of its symmetry. It'll be evaluated at this spatial frequency, delta x over lambda zero d, and we use the scaling theorem. So this will be equal to w sinc w times that spatial frequency, delta x over lambda zero d. So with that, magnitude of mu zero of delta x delta y will be the magnitude of sinc w delta x over lambda zero d times sinc w delta y over lambda zero d. Uh, and you can see that's properly normalized because if you let delta x and delta y both be zero, the sinc of zero is one, so this is one at delta x equals delta y is equal to zero. So, as a function of delta x, this will be the absolute value of a sinc function. If this is zero, the width from the peak to the first zero will be lambda zero d over W. And then our coherence area will be just the integral of the square of mu2. That'll be sinc squared w delta x over lambda 0 d sinc squared w delta y over lambda 0 d d delta x, d delta y. <clears throat> and using the fact that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of sinc squared of u du is equal to one, and then using some scaling here, we can show that this is equal to lambda zero d over w squared, which makes sense because over here, right, we just said that the width of the one of the sinks is lambda zero d over w. So if you multiply in the x and the y dimensions, you just get this thing squared. Now, one way to think about that is suppose we have an object of dimension w and we go off to a distance d and observe it, it will subtend an angle theta, which in the small angle approximation is just w over d. So this can be written, let's see, w over d, that would be in the denominator. This then has a form of lambda zero over theta squared, where theta is just the angle subtended by the incoherent object. So if we take the object to be the sun, uh, theta, in that case, the sun is about the same size as the moon on the sky, about half a degree, which is 8.73 milliradians. And if we take lambda to be 500 nanometers, kind of in the middle of the optical region, then from this formula, we get a coherence area, which is... 57.3 micrometers squared. So two points that are that differ by much more than about 57 micrometers will be incoherent with one another. Uh, conversely, two points that are much closer than 57 microns will be coherent. So there is 
in our normal day-to-day -day life, there is some, some spatial coherence, uh, but it's at such a small scale that we never actually see it, never see the effects, because right? this is microscopic. Let's take, on the other hand, a star. Now, for a star, most stars are so far away that if you didn't have an atmosphere and you looked at them, this angular uh, size of them would be extremely small. But due to turbulence, effectively, stars are limited to about one second of arc, which would be 1 over 60 times 60, or 3,600 degrees of arc. And that's due to turbulence in the atmosphere. So if we plug that in to our formula, we get a coherence area that would be 103 millimeters squared. Okay, so for starlight, uh, you can the field can be coherent on the order of 10 centimeters or so. Okay, so that's a more observable effect. And, in fact, that is the reason why stars twinkle, whereas planets, like Jupiter or Mars, do not. If we looked at Jupiter, it would have an angular extent much bigger than this. And so the light from the sun or from planets is essentially spatially incoherent, whereas the light from stars are essentially spatially coherent. And the, the twinkling of stars is, a, is an effect due to that which we'll talk later when we talk about imaging through random media, like a turbulent atmosphere. Let's now see how we can apply a better model for, for incoherent light. We're going to write J of x1 y1, x2, y2, the mutual intensity between two points in a plane with x and y coordinates, x1, y1, or x2, y2, as i of x, y times an arbitrary function mu of delta x, delta y, where x is just the average of x2 and x1, and delta x is their difference. So point x1 is being expressed as x minus 1 half delta x. So this minus half that is x1, and x2 is x plus 1 half delta x. So with that, um, this will be physically valid, provided only that mu zero, uh, zero is equal to 1. Because then if delta x and delta y are 0, then x1 and x2 are both the same. They're both equal to x and y. And then this becomes i of xy is equal to j of xy xy, which is what has to be true physically, that the mutual intensity between two points that or the same point is just the normal intensity at that point. So this is the only constraint we have. Mu of 0, 0 is equal to 1. Otherwise, mu is an arbitrary function. So in free space, in our formula for the propagation of mutual intensity, we need to calculate h of x1, y1, psi1, eta1, times h conjugate of x2, y2, psi2, eta2. And the, these h's are just the paraxial approximation of a spherical wave. And so out in front, as we already showed, we'll have 1 over lambda 0 d squared. And then we'll have some quadratic phase terms, e to the i pi over lambda 0 d x1 minus psi 1 squared from this first term and from the second term with the conjugate will give us a minus 
x2 minus xi2 squared. And then we'll have the y terms plus y1 minus eta1 squared minus y2 minus eta2 squared. Okay. So that is the, uh, the quadratic phase of this product. And let's look at the, uh, the x terms here. Let's see, we'll have x1 minus psi1 squared minus x2 minus psi2 squared. And using our notation from the previous board that we represent x1 and x2 as x plus or minus 1 half delta x and doing the same thing for, for psi, we'll write this as x minus 1 half delta x, that's x1, and then minus psi1 we'll write in the same way, and then we have a minus sign, so that'll be minus psi, and then minus minus is plus 1 half delta psi. And that whole quantity is squared, so we just rewrote the first term, and now we do the same thing for the second term. x2 is x plus 1 half delta x, and then psi2 is psi plus 1 half delta x, so the minus will give you minus 1 half delta psi quantity squared. When we expand this out, you're going to get an x squared here, minus an x squared there. Every one of these terms, in fact, you're going to get square minus the same thing squared. For, so for all of the squared terms, they're going to go away. And all that's going to leave are the cross terms. You're going to get terms like x uh, times delta x, um, x times psi, uh, psi times delta x, and so on. It's psi times delta psi, and, and et cetera. So let's see, what will those be? Well, we're going to get 2x delta psi from here. Let's see, we're going to, when we take the cross products here, we're going to get 2x times 1 half delta psi. That's just going to be x delta psi. And over here, we're going to get 2x times minus 1 half delta psi. So that's minus x delta psi, but then this minus sign makes that a plus. So you get 2x delta psi. And likewise, we also get all the other cross terms. 2 psi delta x, and then minus 2x delta x there, because here we get minus 2x times 1 half delta x, so that's minus x delta x, and over here we get minus 2x times 1 half delta x, so that's minus 2x delta x. So we get minus 2x delta, delta x, and then we also get minus 2 psi delta psi. So that's for the, the x and psi terms. And for the y and eta terms, we get a very a similar expression, just with x is replaced by y and size replaced by eta. So with this bookkeeping, we end up with h of x1, y1, psi1, eta1, h conjugate of x2, y2, psi2, eta2, is equal to 1 over lambda 0 d squared, and then we get four exponential terms, e to the i 2 pi over lambda 0 d, x delta psi plus y delta eta, and then we break out another term, e to the i 2 pi over lambda 0 d, psi delta x, plus eta delta y, and then we've got e to the minus i, 2 pi over lambda 0 d, x delta x plus y delta y, and e to the minus i, 2 pi over lambda 0 d, psi delta psi, plus eta, delta eta. Now, therefore, our 
propagation of mutual intensity formula now looks like J2, X1, Y1, X2, Y2 is equal to, all right, we're going to multiply this by the J1 mutual intensity and integrate uh, twice over the input plane. Now, this term right here uh, does not depend on psi or delta psi or eta or delta eta. So it can be factored out in front. And so that gives us out in front e to the minus i 2 pi over lambda 0 d x delta x plus y delta y then over lambda 0 d squared. And then we've got a quadruple integral of everything else. So that everything else will be e to the i 2 pi over lambda 0 d x delta psi plus y delta eta e to the i 2 pi over lambda 0 d psi delta x plus eta delta y and then finally this term here e to the minus i 2 pi over lambda 0 d psi delta psi plus eta delta eta and then we multiply that by the input um, uh, mutual intensity which we're expressing as i1 of psi and eta times this function mu1 of delta psi delta eta and so instead of before we were we would integrate over d psi1 d psi2 d eta1 d eta2 now we're integrating uh, over the new variables d psi, d eta, d delta psi, d delta eta. Okay, so we're just parameterizing the input plane instead of in terms of psi 1, eta 1, and psi 2, eta 2, now in terms of psi and eta, which are the averages of those coordinate values, and delta psi and delta eta, which are the differences of the coordinates. Now, there is a problematic term here this one right here and the reason is because that depends both on psi and delta psi so it's going to come into play and also eta and delta eta it comes into play in all of these integrals whereas these two terms well they only depend either on on delta psi and delta eta or on psi and eta not on all four of them so if we could get rid of that term, that would break up this quadruple integral into a product of two double integrals. That would be a great improvement. We would like this, for example, then to be equal, approximately equal to one. Then it would go away. So under what conditions would that be true? Let's see. Well, it would be true if psi delta psi over lambda zero d and eta delta eta over lambda zero d were both much, much less than one because then this would be e to the minus i two pi times very, very tiny numbers. The approximately e to a very small phase, we could treat that as approximately equal to one. Now, since we're trying to model incoherent, spatially incoherent light, it's going to be the case that delta psi over lambda zero from this and likewise delta eta over lambda zero are going to be less than about equal to one right because ideally those would be equal to zero because the difference between two points over which this coherence function is significant um, would be in the ideal limit, the delta function limit, be equal to zero. But we said, no, they can't actually become incoherent over distances much less than a wavelength. 
But in the most practical incoherent case, they certainly it would be the case that if two points were separated by a distance much greater than a wavelength, they'd be practically incoherent. So this will be true for everywhere the mu1 factor is significant. And so then that just leaves that psi over d or eta over d are much, much less than 1. So psi and eta over d is much, much less than 1. And we could say that means then that square root of psi squared plus eta squared is much, much less than d. What that looks like, and is this picture here. So if we have an input intensity function with some radius r, and then this is a distance d to the output plane on the z-axis, then this radius right, over which the intensity is non-zero must be much, much less than the distance to the output plane. So in other words, this will be true if the distance between the input-output planes is much, much larger than the size of the intensity distribution in the input plane. So let's assume that that is the case. It gets rid of this term and then breaks this quadruple integral up into two double integrals. So the output mutual intensity, J2, of x1, y1, x2, y2, will be equal to e to the minus i, 2 pi over lambda 0 d, x delta x plus y delta y, over lambda zero d quantity squared times one of the integrals will be the integral of mu one of delta psi and delta eta e to the i two pi over lambda zero d x delta psi plus y delta eta d delta psi d delta eta, and the second integral will be the integral of i1 of, uh, sorry, of psi and eta e to the i 2 pi over lambda 0 d psi delta x plus eta delta y, d psi, dx. This is the, basically the version of the considered Zernike theorem when we have a more realistic representation of the, uh, the, the mutual uh, intensity function for an incoherent source. Let's call this first term e to the minus i psi over lambda zero d quantity squared. And the second term, let's call this k, big K of x and y. So with that, the Van Sitter Zernike theorem becomes j2 of x1, y1, x2, y2 is equal to e the minus i psi over lambda zero d squared k of x y times the integral of the input intensity times e to the i to pi over lambda zero d psi delta x plus eta delta y d psi d eta. And the only change from before is where we had a constant k before, now we have a function k of x, y. All right. And we've said this is true provided the function we use to represent 
the incoherent field mu1 of delta x a uh, delta psi delta eta satisfies u1 at 0 0 is equal to 1. Okay, now the problem we had before was that when we looked at the out total power in the output, we got an infinite value. So let's see, what would we get here if we did P2 would be the integral of I2 of x and y dx dy. That would be setting delta x and delta y both equal to zero. Psi would go away. And integrating over the... over... Uh, the output plane. Well, let's see, if we, we let delta x and delta y go to zero, this exponential just goes to one, and then this, this integral here is just the integral of i1 over the whole plane. That's just p1, the input power. So this would look like then, well, we'd have to integrate this thing over x and y, so that's going to be, um, let's first put this factor here, uh, i1 integrated over psi and eta, that's p1. We'll have p1 over lambda 0 d quantity squared, and then we have the integral of k of xy. And for power to be conserved in free space, this must be equal to p1, which means we must have the integral of k xy dx dy is equal to lambda zero d quantity squared. And as we show in the notes, uh, you just plug this, plug this guy in, this k, and do this integral dx dy, and this guy gives you a delta function, and you work it out. Uh, just several steps you gotta go through. This is true. In fact, if this original condition is true, which we said has to be anyway, so this will be true for any function, mu1, delta x delta y that we choose to represent the incoherent properties of the input provided that mu1 of 0 0 is equal to 1. So it'll conserve power and the problem we had through those delta functions go away. So let's see how this works out if we take as our description of our coherence at the input, mu1 of delta psi delta eta is a Gaussian. e to the minus pi delta psi squared plus delta a squared over some scale parameter a squared. And typically, a is going to be on the order of the wavelength. Then, our function k of x and y is going to be the integral over delta psi and delta eta of this function e to the minus pi delta psi squared plus delta eta squared over a squared d delta, I'm sorry, times e to the i 2 pi over lambda 0 d x delta psi plus y delta eta d delta psi d delta eta and that's a inverse Fourier transform of a, a Gaussian which is a Gaussian and then we use the scaling theorem to work out that this is a squared e to the minus pi quantity A over lambda zero D squared times X squared plus Y squared. And if A was equal to lambda zero, then this would just be one over D squared, X squared plus Y squared. So with that, the Van Sitter Zernike theorem becomes J2, so the mutual intensity at the output of X1, Y1, x2, y2 is equal to e to the minus i psi, we had a previous board, over lambda 0 d quantity squared 
times this k of x, y, a, e to the minus pi, quantity a over lambda zero d squared, x squared plus y squared, and then times this inverse Fourier transform of the input intensity. I1 of psi eta, e to the i, 2 pi over lambda 0 d, psi delta x plus eta delta y, d psi d eta. So right, this is where before we had just a, we assumed a constant k. Now it's a function of x and y. Under what conditions can we neglect this uh, Gaussian? Well, that would certainly be true if it was e to the some very small number. So that would be true if quantity a over lambda zero d squared times x squared plus y squared, so this exponent up here, was much, much less than one. So if we assume that a, right, what we said is a is on the order of the wavelength, then this would imply that x squared plus y squared, so if we take a over lambda zero to be about equal to one, this would imply that x squared plus y squared is much less than d squared. So here's the picture we have. If this is our input intensity distribution, and it is zero outside of a circle of radius ri and the distance between our input and output plane is d then one of the things we saw previously was that to get these formulas to break up that quadruple integral into a product of two double integrals we had to assume that that input distribution radius was much less than the distance d between input and output planes. And here, now, we're seeing that in order to neglect this e to the minus pi term, we would have to assume that the radius at the output, call it ro, would also be much, much less than d. And if that's true, then we could neglect this and just replace it by a squared there. I'm sorry, that was an a squared. And if a is equal to lambda zero, that, that a squared just cancels this lambda zero squared here and just leaves you one over d squared. So the version of the Van Zetter Cernicki theorem that we obtained using the physically unrealistic, non rigorous model for incoherent light works, provided that we assume we're only looking at the, uh, the output field and its mutual intensity over a radius that's much less than the distance between the input and output planes. Otherwise, we have to use this more rigorous version.